right, we'll turn that on for the folks at home. We had some technical difficulties last week and we were not able to record. But this week, praise God, we can. So we took a break last week from 1 Timothy and we talked about what makes a good worship song, amen? And at some point I plan on sitting down in a, some kind of setting and re-going over that because people are asking for it. So I'll get that up on the YouTubes here shortly. But we're gonna turn our attention from how to behave in the household of God, who we are, to how to behave in the household of God, what we do. So we talked about who we are as the household of God. Now we're gonna talk about what we do as the household of God, okay? And if you remember, uh, the big idea was that God's household is the church and the church is charged with living in accord with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and upholding that truth. And we are gonna be in 1 Timothy chapter four today. And we're gonna read verses one through five. I'm so sorry, I got the sniffles. But I'll, let's all stand if you're able to honor the reading of God's word. And this is what it says. Oh, not sure what happened there. Bear with me. That should fix it. There we go. All right, 1 Timothy 4. 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Father, please bless the reading of your word this morning in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we've worked our way through first Timothy, uh, we've arrived at chapter four, and as we looked at Paul's instructions, uh, we find these verses have a twofold application for, for the church today. It had uh, applications then, it has applications now, okay? And it's twofold. First, we see these verses are filled with personal instructions to Timothy, and we all know who Timothy was. Uh, he was a young man that Paul took up under his wing. Paul was mentoring this young man training him, we know they were very close, right? Uh, Paul often referred to Timothy as his son in the faith and so on. And so application one is Paul's words apply directly to Timothy and the other elders. And we've been taking a look at that over the last couple months. Um, we've talked about elders, deacons, and so on, right? Shepherds. And then application two is where Paul is speaking about things that are important to the church as a whole. These things apply to every single member of the church, whether you have a leadership title or you're a lay person that, that helps out and serves at the church doing different things. These things apply to everyone. OK, he's talking about every member and what he's speaking about is what we as the church need to be doing in these later times. If you remember, Paul used the word, he described the times as later times. And so we need to understand what Paul means by this. And so the phrase later times is basically the New Testament's description of the period between uh, Jesus' ascension into heaven after his life, death, and resurrection, he ascended back into heaven and his second coming. The Bible refers to that, that whole time period as later times, right? From his ascension to his second coming is referred to as later times. And we need to note something. 
every follower of Christ during this time needs to be careful and watch out for possible danger or difficulty during these later times. We're supposed to always be on guard, right? We're supposed to always be on guard for false teachers, false teaching. We're to protect one another. If we see one of our own getting into something that's dangerous, we're supposed to be on guard. We're supposed to go to them and warn them and protect them and try to help them. And so what is the first thing we do? And Paul says it right in verse one. What's the first thing we do? Now, the spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And so the first thing that we point out here that we catch is we are to discern error in the church. And I know I sound like a broken record sometimes about beware of false teachers and false doctrine. But you know why I do that? Because God's word does it. Paul does it in just about every letter. Paul mentions false teachers, false teaching. Beware, be careful. Wolves in sheep's clothing and so on. Does he not? And now with social media and TV and and podcasts and that there's a lot of false teaching out there. There's a lot of false teaching. And so we got to we got to have discernment. What is discernment? It means you can tell that's false. That's true, right? This is a lie. This is someone being honest. We're supposed to have discernment. Okay, so apparently at the church in Ephesus, um, there were people there that were spreading false teaching. And that's why Paul is talking about this. The false teachers were questioning the true meaning of the word. They were questioning the true meaning of the word. Do we see that today? We do. And I'm going to give you a few examples here. Does the Bible really say homosexuality is a sin? Does it really say that? Yeah. Yeah, it does. What about this one? Does the Bible really say marriage is one man and one woman for life? Does it really say that? Yeah, yeah, but there's some who say, you know, no. They, they find loopholes and ways around, right? And, you know, hey, if it feels good, do it. And if I kind of, you know, want to do this, can I kind of make... In my mind, can I kind of make God's word say what I want it to say instead of people do that, right? Yeah, it's a scary place to be. It's a scary thing to do. You don't want to do that. Here's one we just talked about a while ago, and it has to do with order more than it has to do with it. It's not an equality issue. It's, it's the way God wants things ordered. Here's another one. Does the Bible really say women aren't supposed to be pastors? Again, not an equality thing. It's an order thing. It's how God wants the order of things to go. It has nothing to do with men being more important than women or anything like that, right? Equal value, different roles, that kind of thing. But hey, people are going to twist that like there's no tomorrow. They're doing it now. They're probably continue to do it until the Lord comes home. And so Paul told Timothy and the church to watch out for these false teachers. It's implied that we continue to watch out for these people in the church today. Here's something that may shock you. What does Paul say about false teaching? He calls it the teaching of demons. Wow. That makes sense, right? Satan's the father of lies. Demons. Fallen angels, right? Wreaking havoc on the earth. Messing with us. Trying to get us to believe lies, right? He calls false doctrine demonic. So let me be bold and tell you, the next time somebody tries to pass off the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel as the gospel, 
that's coming straight from demons. That's coming straight from demons. Verse one clearly identifies false teaching as such. And Paul is talking about people who had apparently devoted themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. An example for today would be someone who devotes themselves to a false teacher and spreads the false teachings of that teacher. And unfortunately, we see a lot of that today too, right? We see health, wealth, and prosperity guys on TV and these poor people, they're giving all their money to these people. And it's evil, it's demonic. It's not the true gospel. And you see these people that are victims that are being so taken advantage of and they're so loyal to these false teachers, right? And that's an example for today. And then again, we already use discernment and not be fooled or led astray by these people. Again, I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record and I'm sorry, but in a way I'm not sorry. <laughs> What's the old saying, sorry, not sorry? I love you, but I'm not sorry for me sounding like a broken record on this. Folks, we gotta know the word of God. We have to know it inside and out. We gotta know it as much as we possibly can. Justin and I met here yesterday working on some plans for youth and just talking about things. And, and uh, we were just talking about this very thing, how we have to be so careful with the word of God, right? If you don't understand something, don't just make something up. That's how false teaching starts. Well, this is what I think it means. Really? Well, what do you think the author meant? That's where our mind, that's where our mind needs to go. What did God want to say to me through this? What is God saying? Not what do I want it to say or what do I think it says? What is the author trying to communicate to me? Trying, I hate using that. I, sh I need to stop using that word. What is God communicating to me? Not what I want it to say, but what is he saying? Right, and then I should line up with that whether I want it to say that, right? What's the saying? My opinion doesn't matter when it comes to God's word. God's opinion is the only opinion that matters. And so the, the more you get to know the word of God, the easier it's gonna be for you to spot a fake, for you to spot a phony. Someone's gonna say something false and you're gonna immediately go, hey. I don't know, that don't sound right. Here's a quote from a commentator. Don't be fooled, false teaching is demonic. It is straight from hell and it comes to life through deceptive teachers. These teachers are liars whose consciences, consciences are sealed. In verse two, let's look at this. I'll just put it up here for you. Their conscience, con I can't say it. their consciences are sealed. They are men and women who have become numb to the truth and are spreading irrelevant or irreverent and silly myths. Verse seven. Next. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. These are not individuals who rise up in the church and announce, my conscience is seared and I'm here to spread lies and silliness. You're not going to see that. No one's going to stand up and do that, right? If it were only that simple, and he goes on to say that makes false teaching deceptive. That's what makes it deceptive. And it often comes from people in the church who claim to be spreading the truth. I saw a health, wealth, and prosperity guy recently. And I've watched it a couple of times because I just can't believe it. He claims to have had an out-of-body experience where he goes to heaven where God like sucked him up through the roof of a, a hotel room, just like he did, you know, Paul back in the day or whatever. He's trying to claim it was somewhat similar. And he gives the biggest load of malarkey. I hope malarkey is not a bad word in another language because I just said it. But he comes up with all this garbage story, right? And he's exaggerating and he's just spinning this tale, spinning this yarn. And talking about angels and getting to meet Abraham and Paul and 
Paul telling him, preach the gospel. You know, yeah, you're doing great. And I mean, if you're interested, I'll send it to you. And the whole time I'm watching this, the secondhand embarrassment, like I can feel the heat just permeating off my neck. I'm like, how can this man stand up in front of that many people and just lie like this? How do I know it's a lie? Because what he was saying doesn't line up with the word. God gave us the word for a reason, right? If it matches the word, it's true. If it doesn't match the word, it's false. How do you know what's false and what's true? Know the word. Again, sorry, not sorry, broken record. I love y'all, or I wouldn't be harping on it. We gotta know the word. But this guy gets up there in front of all these people and he's just spinning this tail. I'll send it to you if you're, if you're interested, I'll send it to you. And I'm thinking, this guy has been called out, right? Legitimate teachers of God's word have contacted this person and said, you better repent of this foolishness. And he won't do it. You know why? That'd be embarrassing, wouldn't it? To have to go out in front of the whole world and say, hey, I lied about my trip to heaven. You know another reason why he won't do it? Justin's going like this. Yeah. Think he wants to lose all that money people are giving him? Week after week, month after month, year after year? No. His conscience is seared. He has made his decision. God may have something else in plan down the road for him. He may repent. I'm not God. I don't know. I'm praying he does. I'm praying he does. We'll get to that later too here in a minute. So another thing we need to keep in mind was that when Paul was speaking, he was speaking to the elders. This implies that some of the false teachers he was referring to may have been former elders in Ephesus. It may seem shocking, but it's true. A few years back, before I came here, I was a member of a church where someone got voted in as pastor. I'm not going to name names. It's not important. And when he first arrived, he was pretty much teaching stuff that was according to the Baptist faith and message, right? Uh, and then over time, he started preaching things that were more and more health, wealth, and prosperity stuff. And a bunch of us caught on, and a lot, of, a lot of the people there didn't because they didn't know the Word of God. The people that knew the Word of God at that church said, ooh, something is wrong with this. You can't speak your reality into existence just because God did it. That's an example of the crazy heresy that this guy was saying that because God can speak reality into existence, if we're, if we're born again, we have that same power. We can say, you know, I do not have cancer. Cancer, I rebuke you in the name of, you know, and you can speak that into reality and the cancer will magically go away. And then if it doesn't, well, you don't have enough faith. It's your fault, not God's fault. You know why that is so dangerous? When you don't get your healing and you're going, I want more faith. God, increase my faith. And it never happens. What is your belief about God going to be? What, what's going to happen? God doesn't love me. God's not real. He's not increasing my faith. He's not healing me. There's something wrong with me. And then do you know what happens? Most people turn their back on God. And it's all because of false teaching. This is serious. This is extremely serious. People end up in hell over believing false doctrine and theology. And you get these new preachers of today and they're like, well, you know, doctrine and theology, that's, who cares? 
It's like, apparently Paul did. Apparently God does because <laughs> it's in his word. Amen. So false teachings always been a problem for the church. We see it. We see false prophets in the Old Testament. We see false prophets and teachers in the New Testament. And it just goes on and on and on. And guys, we got to fight the good fight. We can't just sit on the sidelines and just let this false teaching go out. We can't do this. We can't do that. So here we go. Here's some examples. And I borrowed this from a commentator. I put it in my own words, but I borrowed it from a commentary. Okay, just to go over some theology that's false that is popular today. The prosperity theology, we just talked about it, right? Health, wealth, and prosperity. These guys and gals are gonna tell you, hey, if you just trust Jesus, your life is gonna get so much better. You're gonna be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. You can say goodbye to being broke. You can say goodbye to being sick. Jesus makes it all better. What does scripture actually say? What does Jesus actually say? In this world, you will have trouble. When Paul had his thorn in the flesh and he was suffering because of it, and he prayed three times, Lord, take it away. What was he told? My grace is sufficient for you. God basically tells him, I have it there for a reason to keep you humble. Why is the health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine bogus? Because it's not biblical. The Bible tells us following Christ is hard. It's not easy. You will suffer. It doesn't mean you're going to have a lot of money. If you do, God wants you to use it for his glory. He's got a reason for you having a lot of money if you have it. But if you don't, right? Paul says, I've learned to be content in every circumstance. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. By the way, that doesn't mean you're going to win uh, the big game. <laughs> what if someone on the other team is praying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Somebody's got to lose. Man, false teaching is so big of a problem. So that's the prosperity theology. Next, cult theology. You may find this one interesting. Some of you I know are very familiar with cults. Look at this, cult theology teaches Jesus is not who you thought he was. The Bible says Jesus is God. A cult would go, well, he's a God, but he's not the God. Some cults would say he's an angel, but he's not, he's not God, right? And we know clearly the Bible teaches Jesus is God in human flesh, right? And so they offer an alternative Jesus which always turns out to be unbiblical. It always turns out to be unbiblical. I had some friends in a cult I was talking to and they said, uh, why do you believe we're going to hell when we die? I said, because your faith isn't in the real Jesus. You believe in a fake Jesus, a, ma a made up Jesus that it's not the real Jesus. And then I proceeded to meet with them over two years and show them in a loving way, because I, I did love them. I care about them to this day. You believe in a phony Jesus. It's not the real Jesus. Popular theology is the next one. Consists of idea, and Justin's gonna laugh because we talked about this yesterday. So it kind of lined up perfectly. Uh, popular theology consists of ideas about life, possessions, heaven, and the afterlife that are based more on best-selling books than on scripture. Do you care if I share a little bit? Okay, so we met we met up here. Uh, as you know, Justin and Renee are working with the youth right now, right? They're on a three, four week. We're going to give them three, four weeks so far. I've had nothing but positive feedback. So thank you. Um, Justin's being extremely responsible. They run everything by me before they do anything. And if there's anything that... I feel like the leadership, no, of course, you guys know I go, I'd send you a text or I talk to you and say, hey, this is what's going on, right? So it's, it's all good right now. Keep praying for them because the enemy, we have a real enemy that doesn't want 
the youth ministered to, but we have a God that has defeated that foe. Amen? And so we're going to press on. So I said all that to say this. Justin says, can you meet with me on Saturday morning? And I'm like, well, sure. And then uh, he said, I'll make you some delicious biscuits and gravy. And I said, I will be there. And so nine o'clock this morning, or nine o'clock yesterday morning, we were both here and he was already here and he had his apron on. And, no, I'm just playing. He wasn't wearing an apron. That'd have been funny though. But uh, he did, he kept his word. They, they were delicious. Um, but one of the things they asked me, this is where this is all going. I'm sorry, I, King of Random Thoughts. Is <laughs> Justin says, Brother Eric, what do you think about these books? And this may make some people mad. I love you if it does, right? He says, what do you think about these books? Uh, heaven is for real, right? 23 minutes in hell and things of, things of that nature. And uh, I said, honestly? And he goes, yeah. I said, I, I think they're false teaching. I think they're bogus. And uh, the big reason for that is after you've done serious, in-depth study of scripture for over the years, when they're describing things that they saw and it doesn't match up with scripture, like the, the situation and everything, you can just tell. You're like, well, it's, it's not biblical. And we talked about it and we went over some things and we both agreed there's a problem with these things, right? One of these was we found out, I already knew, but I shared with him that the, the one, I believe I may get this wrong, but one of those books, I think it is Heaven is for Real, where the little boy uh, was talking about his visions of heaven and stuff. You, did you guys know he came out years later and said it was a lie? I'm sorry. He, he came out years later and says it was a lie. Here's something disgusting. He and his family repented, apparently, I think. That's how the story goes. And they went to the book publisher and said, please stop selling these books. It's not true. And the publisher said, this is how the story goes. The publisher said, we're making too much money. What was the other thing we learned? That boy is in a wheelchair, like he's got a serious health issue. And folks, listen to me very, very carefully. Don't mess with the word of God. Don't be a false prophet. Don't spread false teaching. Don't be a false teacher. This is serious, man. This is serious. I'm begging God that all of us at Providence, that no false teaching is going to come out of here. Not, not deliberately anyway. I know every once in a while we run into something and it's like we research it, look into it. Some of us may already have an answer. Some of us may not. And we're like, ooh, I was wrong about that. So you know what you do? You say, ooh, Lord, I am so sorry. And then you go back to everybody else and you say, ooh, I am so sorry. I've actually had to do that from the pulpit. It wasn't a major issue, but I was wrong about something one time. And my friend lovingly called me and said, hey, you said this and this is, and I was like, So I got up and I said, hey guys, I said this at such and such a time and I was wrong. Um, I'm so sorry. Here's the way it really is. Do y'all forgive me? We forgive you. <laughs> right? Thank you. We got to be so careful. That's why people say, you know, when people hear things like a pastor is supposed to spend 20 hours a week just on his Sunday morning sermon. You know why? Because if you're a pastor worth your salt, you want to make diggity dog sure you're not preaching something false. We have to answer for that. Justin knows now, you know, he's leading the youth. He's dipping his toes in the water, seeing how it goes. He knows, he told me, I know I'm going to be held responsible for some someday for what I'm teaching these young people, and I want to get it right. Probably spend six to eight hours the whole week in his spare time making sure that one hour in that class goes right. 
And I love you for it. I love you for it. Yes, sir. And when he calls me different times and he texts me and he does, I mean, and we go back and forth. I'd rather have that than someone who just says, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just take a guess. It's like, no, please don't ever do it. Yeah. There's kids in there. So anyway, let's keep going. Popular theology is based on books. Somebody the other day uh, that's new in my circle said something about, was talking about how great that book, The Shack, was. The Shack, the movie, and the book is completely unbiblical. There's so much riddled in through there that's just wrong. If you want to know about that, I'll send you some stuff on it that's biblical. It shows you straight from Scripture why... Now, I'm not saying, well, we'll talk about that later. So here's, here's an illustration. I was like, Lord, please give me an illustration. And then I thought of the TV show. Does anybody in here ever watch the Antique Roadshow? There we go. So I love that show, right? I love it, man, because you never know what people have. And it's like you never know what they found or what's been passed down. So let me get on with the illustration here and you'll understand completely what I'm talking about. This is what I have in my notes. The experts on Antique Roadshow can always spot a fake because they're experts on the real thing. Because they're experts on the real thing. If they look at a painting and someone says, this is a blankety blank so-and-so painting, you know, early American history and whatever, and uh, this was passed down to me and I, I want to know how much it's worth and they'll think it's worth $2 million or I'm just making this up, $2 million, right? And then the professional, the expert, will take a look at it and they'll say, do you, do you care if I fold up this, this corner? No, and then they, they look at the corner and there's a signature there, but they're such an expert, they can tell the signature's a fake. And they're like, I'm sorry, this is only worth a couple hundred bucks because it's a fake. We need to be experts in the word like that. Where the moment somebody teaches something bogus or says something bogus, we can be like, no, no, <laughs> nah. Can we, we need to talk about this because that ain't right, right? And if their consciences are seared, they're not going to listen to reason and they're going to walk away and keep preaching a false gospel. And I wouldn't want to be them on the day they stand before God. Paul warns us about false teachers. Let's keep going. You know, should we be surprised by false teachers? Not if you know the word. We just talked about how Paul warned everybody, warns us today when we read it today. Watch out for false teachers, right? Do you know why we shouldn't be surprised by them? Because scripture talks about them. Look at this. Look at this. It's talking about people who were in the circle, right? Doing the ministry, hanging out at church. But then listen to what happens. Professing believers, right? Quote, unquote. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. You ever wonder how many people claim to be believers and they're, they're really not at all? They might be able to put on a good show on the outside, but inside they, they don't really believe. How many times have we seen people make a profession of faith in Christ and then when God doesn't give them what they want, they say, forget you, God. You never see him again. Newsflash. It ain't about what we want. We need to want what God wants. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know what? We shouldn't be surprised by them, but we should always be saddened by them. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard people talk about um, Mormons coming to the door, Jehovah's Witnesses coming to the door, and then they claim to be a believer, but then they brag about how they told them off and slammed the door in their face. Wow. Let's get this straight. Someone who needs Jesus Christ and has been misled and taught, taught false teaching comes to your door. They desperately need the real Jesus. And you think you're all big and bad because you won an argument, told them off, and slammed the door in their face and told them to get lost. <laughs> That's what I do when they come to my door. That's tragic, man. I was meeting with Mormons uh, for two years. I met with Mormons and we got real close. We loved each other, man. We were friends. And I remember my friend James uh, that was witnessing to the Mormons with me. We were meeting with them and talking and uh, we'd see him, I think Tuesdays and Thursdays for a couple hours. And one of the, either he would ask it or I would ask it. I'd say, so how many Baptists slammed the door in your face today? And they'd say five, three, sometimes more. And all James and I could do is look at each other and look at them with tears in our eyes and go, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. People going to hell because they believe in a false gospel and we're going to brag about how we told them off and slammed the door in their face. Shame on us. We should always be saddened. The consequences of false teaching can be eternal and horrific. We're talking about an eternity in hell. If people don't believe in the real gospel, the real biblical Jesus... They go to hell. And we need to be <laughs> so ready and willing to share the gospel every chance we get. We need to pray, God, give us opportunities to share the gospel. Right? And then when an opportunity presents itself, take it. This is why we need to keep, uh, to strive and keep false teaching out of the church and do our best to keep people from believing it. Here's one. We need to pray for false teachers. I kind of touched on this earlier, where when we look at the TV and we see the, the Benny Hens and the Kenneth Copelands and the list goes on and on and on and they're pushing their health, wealth, and prosperity garbage. We need to pray for them that God will open their eyes to the truth and they'll repent of what they're doing. And come to genuine saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have an attitude of where you're just kind of like, ah, they're a false teacher, money grab, that may be true. But if your attitude is, let them go to hell, I don't care. Ooh, that's a red flag on you. If that's our attitude, that's a red flag on us. They deserve hell. Let them go there, I don't care. That is not a Christ like thought. We need to pray for these false teachers. We don't need to believe them, follow them, but we do need to pray for them that God will open their eyes and that they'll repent. Amen? And if you were here when we started working our way through 1 Timothy a while back, or you watched the, the sermons on YouTube, you may remember Paul begins his letter by telling Timothy to confront men who were perverting the truth. Look at this, 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4. He opens the letter this way. As I urged when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. So here we got Paul right out of the gate. 
saying bad theology. It's got to be addressed. Confront these people, right? So how do we know? Here's the, here's the big question. How do we know as the church when error is being taught? And the answer is we need to always consider the substance of what's being said. Is it biblical? Paul mentions two specific errors we need to be on the lookout for. This we need to pay special. I can't talk. This we need to pay special attention to. Okay? If Jess was up here right now, he would do this. These are Jess's wisdom fingers. Jason. We need to consider the substance of what's being said. Here's the two things to always look out for. Are you ready? I'm hoping and praying God opens all our hearts and minds to, to let this soak in and that we'll remember this for the rest of our days and teach it to others. Here's what we need to look out for. False teaching denies the goodness of God. You may say, huh? Health, wealth, and prosperity sounds pretty good. Just wait. If it's a lie, is it still good? No. And they distort the word of God. They deny the goodness of God and they distort the word of God. What do I mean by that? When you put these two characteristics together, what does it remind you of? The garden? When sin entered the world? What did the serpent trick Eve into doing? Did God really say? Did God really say that? He's not good. You know why? He doesn't want you to know everything he knows. He doesn't want you to be like him. And that's why he's telling you not to eat that. Go ahead, eat it. He's tempting her to deny the goodness of God. He's tempting her to deny the greatness of God. In other words, saying you can't trust him. He's holding you back. So notice what the serpent emphasized, God's power and greatness, and notice what he minimized, God's love and goodness. So the serpent says, oh yeah, God's powerful and great for sure, but he doesn't want you to eat that because he knows you'll be like him when you do. So he minimizes God's love and goodness. How is that? The reason God said don't eat that is because he loved them. And he knew that as soon as they ate the fruit that they were commanded not to eat, they would surely die. It's still happening today. False teachers today, y'all. Just like the serpent. The, the serpent tempted Eve to doubt God had her best interests in mind. He was leading her to question God's goodness and distort God's word. Eve fell for a hook, line, and sinker. And we're still reeling from the effects today. We're almost done. Similar things go on in Paul's day. Uh, same thing is going on today. Some teachers in Paul's day were teaching that certain foods should not be eaten. And people should not get married and so on. However, these claims were countered by Paul. He taught that marriage and food are both good gifts from God. And both are meant to be received with gratitude to God in prayer. Look at this. First Timothy 4, verses 4 and 5. Look at that again. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So church, we, we have to be on the lookout for false teachers that deny the goodness of God and distort the word of God. Teachers that add to the word and teachers that take away from the word. We need to be experts on the word. That's the application for today. You wanna know the counterfeit immediately? Be an expert on the real thing. Many of you have heard me, I use the antique roadshow illustration a second ago, and many of you have heard me talk about when Jamie was in management at the bank, and she had to go through all this like FBI training, seriously. And uh, she come home, and she, some of you have heard this before, I'm sorry. 
But she come home and I'm like, how'd work go? How was the training? And she's like, oh, it was really interesting. And she's like, we had to learn all about counterfeit money today. And I'm like, wow, you probably saw a bunch of counterfeit money. And she's like, actually, no, they didn't bring any in. And I was like, what? And she says, all we talked about today was the real thing. We learned all the little details, all the little pictures, symbols, details, the way lines, I mean, they went into depth and made them experts on the real thing. And she says, and then when we did our test, she said, all, you, all I had to do was look and I could see, yeah, that's fake, that's fake, that, that's real, that's fake. Let's get like that with the word, amen. Amen. If we someone headed for hell because they believe in a fake Jesus and a fake gospel, let's step up. And instead of making fun of these people and slamming the door in their face or whatever, let's say, can I talk to you for a minute? What led you to that belief? Right? And you ask questions and you listen. And then most importantly, can I share with you what I believe from scripture and why? And we share the real gospel. Then you know what? We've done what we're supposed to do. It's, it's not our job to save someone. It's our job to tell someone. Amen? Let's all stand. If you're able, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And what is the true gospel? One of Jess's favorite sayings is we need to go back to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ for sinners. That's the gospel. That's the easiest way to say it. Amen. God created man. We talked about it. Man sinned, disobeyed God, brought a curse down on all of us. God had a plan. He would send his perfect, holy, sinless son to live a perfect life on earth that you and I could not live to die a death on a cross in our place that you and I very much deserve. And God raised him from the dead to show the world, this is my son. He is who he says he is. And then Jesus ascended into heaven. And if we believe in the life, death, and resurrection for our sin, for the forgiveness of our sin, and in Christ alone, no works that we can do in and of ourselves, if we believe that Jesus paid it all, Jesus did it all, on our behalf, Jesus in our place. If you believe that, you can be saved. You can be in a right relationship with God forever. But make no mistake about it. That doesn't mean your life is going to be a big bowl of peaches or whatever. Right? No more suffering. No more poverty. No more sickness. We're going to suffer. That's what it says in scripture. We're going to suffer. We're going to experience it. But I'll tell you what, the other thing that scripture says is that God will be with us. If you're a child of God, you don't have to go through that suffering alone and God can even make good come out of it. How about that? That's the truth that's in the scriptures. Amen? Amen. Let's sing.